Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. It's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Parag Agnihotri. Dr. Agnihotri received his MD degree at the Mahatma Gandhi Mission Medical College and completed his residency, chief residency, and geriatrics fellowship at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Dr. Agnihotri serves as the chief medical officer for the Population Health Services Organization for UC San Diego Health. He oversees the Physician Network, a clinically integrated network made up of UC San Diego Health faculty, regional hospitals, community primary care providers, and specialists. His role focuses on reforming healthcare by working with multidisciplinary teams to build and implement tools that improve the health of the population. As a practicing physician in the Division of Geriatrics, Dr. Agnihotri leads the post-acute care strategy for UC San Diego Health and plays a key role in supporting teams that serve the elderly patient populations. Dr. Agnihotri is a California Healthcare Foundation Fellow and has been designated as an innovation advisor by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. In 2019, he received the Multi-Community Innovative Leadership Award from the Right Care Initiative, which recognizes healthcare leaders and innovators across California. He has published numerous articles on the management and outcomes of high-risk populations and is recognized as a national leader in, develop in the development of high-performing health systems technology use, and population health management. We're fortunate to have him here today speaking to us on advancing population health. Thank you, Dr. Agnihotri. Good morning, everyone. And good morning, Dr. Jassal, for such a kind introduction. Um, so at this stage, you know, I think um, I'm supposed to share something about myself. Um, and uh, share with you about something about my career or, you know, I wish I had a very interesting backstory, but as you heard from Dr. Jasal, you know, my interest is in how do we take better care of our community or at least improve the health of our community. So in my career, you know, um, as I've come across uh, the care of older adults or patients with chronic illnesses, I've realized that, you know, sometimes the care was disjointed, you know, even to our best of intent, you know. So that led me to pursue healthcare leadership role uh, in the hope that, you know, I could at least try to fix some of these problems or at least importantly, make some kind of difference in our community uh, to, uh, in how we manage patients um, on an outpatient or ambulatory setting, you know. But on this journey, uh, I have learned to have a sort of a holistic approach. Uh, you know, I've tried to also be a lifelong learner. Um, you know, I learned from people around me, like many of you who are in this meeting uh, as my colleagues uh, and some national leaders, but also I try to learn from other places and I also try to learn uh, from our, uh, our dog, you know. So one thing which I wanna share with you today is, you know, five work lessons I have learned uh, from our dog, you know, Charlie. You know. So my dog, our dog name is Charlie. And what I want to share with you is that he has taught us that, that you know, persistence pays off. Um, sometimes it's best to sit close and listen. Explore everything. Understand the importance of connection. And lastly, and importantly, that things will be okay. You know, know that it's going to be okay at some points. So I hope uh, I was able to share with you about something about myself and what I try to strive from, even from our dog and try to bring those work lessons. So with that, you know, uh, why don't we uh, get into discussion about population health, what's happening at UCSD Health. Um, and share some of the programs which we have uh, at UCSD. So the roadmap for today's grand round is 
you know, I'll share with you the transition to value-based care. I'll share why population health, examples of population health programs, and support for population health programs. So hopefully I could share, uh, provide you some insight, you know, what's happening at UCSD Health in this space. So first let's tackle why transition to value-based care. So at UCSD Health, you know, this is the slide which we use all the time as a strategy slide, which we talk about it as if we are going, you know, we are shifting from curve one to curve two, and those are the lingo we use at UCSD. But what does it mean? You know, basically it means that we are trying to move from a volume-based healthcare to a value-based healthcare. So on the left-hand side, if you see in the blue box, volume is that we are paid just for fee for service, quality is not rewarded financially, there's no shared financial risk. Um, on the, on the right-hand side, you see that there is a value-based care, which basically means that we are paid for quality and efficiency also. Uh, we are uh, paid for doing population health management, you know, care coordination and all those services. And in the midst of uh, shifting from volume to value, we also have to address key factors like government regulation, payer demands, employer demands, et cetera. So we are trying to make this shift uh, in certain areas, trying to move from really volume to value or, or as we call it, curve one to curve two. The why have we have to do this, you know? If you take a national perspective and I'll let you read this from what, how the, uh, what's happening on the national level and the state level, but I'll let you read this statement from our Fed chair, Jay Powell from some time back. And the reason for his, you know, persistence is that, you know, if you look at where we are, we are with the national healthcare expenditure, you know, the national healthcare expenditure is now close to 18% of GDP. If you take a look at Medicare spending, the Medicare spending has grown to almost $800 billion a few years back, you know. So what comprises Medicare spending? If you, if you break down what Medicare spending is in from some years back, you can see that 30% of it is in the rising Medicare Advantage plans, and I will talk about it in a minute. But then 21% is on the hospital inpatient side, 14% is outpatient prescription drug, 10% is physician payments, and the rest of it is uh, services like skill nursing facility, home health, et cetera. But when we look at the rising spend, what is happening is that the solvency of the Medicare or the Medicare Hospital Insurance Trust Fund is getting depleted. You know, If you look on some of the milestones, um, when the ACA Act was passed around 2009, um, there was almost 19 years of solvency of the Hospital Insurance Trust Fund. But over time, because of tax cuts or COVID spending, the Hospital Insurance Trust Fund or Medicare solvency of this fund is going to be only four years and it's expected as of today that you know, that by 2026, unless something is done, Medicare will not be able to pay the bills, all the bills it incurs for the hospital or healthcare system expenditures. So with this dire state, you can understand why Medicare, which is one of the largest payers, is trying to really shift us in the last 10 years to move from a volume-based healthcare system to value-based healthcare system and they want to transform our healthcare system by looking at, you know, trying to have three goals. You know, they want three goals for their beneficiaries or their members. Uh, what are, are we offering better care? Is it smarter spending? And are we uh, having healthier people? And the way CMS or Medicare is trying to do this is through providing incentive dollar, uh, focusing on reforming care delivery, and really uh, working on information sharing. So to give you uh, some examples and uh, continuing to use Medicare as a, uh, as a payer, uh, because you know there are other payers, but what Medicare does, everyone else tends to follow. If you look at Medicare beneficiaries, uh, in San Diego County, 49% of Medicare beneficiaries are in fee-for-service type of payment, and 51% are in Medicare Advantage or HMO type of pay payment model. So let's look first on the left-hand side on the green boxes, you know, what does Medicare, what does value-based care for fee-for-service mean? So first is, you know, uh, if you look, there is a merit-based payment system. It's a low risk, low reward program. 
And then there is alternative payment model, which is one of the models in, in that is accountable care organization or ACO, and it's a high risk, high reward model. So uh, to further drill down, you know, when you look at MEPS or merit-based incentive system, what it does is basically merit-based MEPS program, you know, creates a composite performance score based on how we uh, as an individual physician, so it's all about individual physician or individual APP. An individual physician, for example, is scored on quality, resource use, clinical practice improvement, uh, meaningful use of EHR. Resource use is basically total cost of care. And based on this, there's a composite score created and which on based on which there is a percentage applied, which is uh, like either two to 4% of incentive you receive or two to 4% of penalties you receive on every single Medicare Part B claim which you file. So uh, most, you know, there are 900,000 eligible providers in the country, uh, but you know, uh, mostly small practices tend to uh, apply for merit-based uh, payment system and try to, uh, because a low risk, low reward program. While at UCSD Health, uh, we are uh, in Medicare Accountable Care Organization program which means that all of us, all physicians, all eligible providers, we are scored as a group under the UCSD Accountable Care Organization or UCSD ACO program. And to share how we are paid, uh, on the left-hand side, you can see that you know, uh, under the ACO program, we have, for example, 32,000 beneficiaries assigned. Medicare then assigns us a budget or a total expenditure of $400 million for these 32,000 beneficiaries, which comes to close to $12,200 per member per year. That's how much the budget we are assigned. But I want you to take a pause and really look at it. You know, 32,000 members having an expenditure of $400 million. And just think about it. You know, why may you can now start to understand why Medicare is so interested in us in moving us into value-based care. So after this, you know, we have to then meet some population health measures as a gate, things like diabetes control, advanced care planning, depression, risk scoring. And then after that, you know, on an annual basis, there is an actual analysis done, which uh, based on which we can either get a portion of the shared saving or, or we can get a portion of the shared losses. So the portion of shared saving can be up to $60 million, but a portion of the shared losses, we, if in case if we don't do well, we may have to write a check up to $45 million. So this is what keeps me up at night, uh, trying to make sure that we perform well at not only providing good care for patients, but also that we are financially sustainable in this program. If you look on the right hand side, you know, let's look into Medicare Advantage, you know. So Medicare Advantage, the way we get paid is it's a flat monthly payment. It's an outcome-based payment. And what has happened in San Diego, there has been really, uh, you know, the Medicare Advantage plans are just mushrooming, you know, everywhere. And I think they're growing because um, there are 10,000 baby boomers which are aging into this range every day. So that whether you're a Sharp, a system, you're Kaiser or Scripps, everyone is in Medicare Advantage and so is UCSD and some of the other UC campuses also. If you look in San Diego County, uh, a Medicare senior now has almost uh, 40 to 50 plans they can choose from and, uh, as their insurance and receive care under the Medicare Advantage plan. And hence, you know, in San Diego, it's more than 50% penetration rate. You know. The way we get paid in Medicare Advantage is pretty uh, simple. Uh, if you look, it's a capitation type of payment. It's a per member per month. And uh, you can see uh, on the capitation revenue, it's a fixed amount. But in case if we do, you know, if we are not able to control cost, we tend to have losses uh, on this program. And if we, if we do well, then there's profit, which we tend to reinvest back into the healthcare system for the operation, uh, for the day-to-day -day operations. You know. But nowadays we don't get just paid flat fee. Nowadays we also have additional uh, layer of complexity on how we are getting paid. It's on by trying to demonstrate the medical complexity of the members. 
So on the left hand side, if you see Mrs. Jones, let's say her risk score is one and let's assume for hypothetical reason that the per member per month base rate is around $800. But on the right hand side is Mr. Smith, who has three plus chronic conditions, and we did a good job of documenting and capturing those ICD-10 codes, then we would get a blended payment rate of around $2,400 per member per month. Now you start multiplying this on a larger population, and let's say even for now, I'll just use 2,000 members, and we have a risk score of one, which is an average risk score. The amount of money which we would have for expenditure is about here. But let's just say that you know, tomorrow we did a good job of documenting and really capturing the chronic condition which the member has. And we are always very careful. We want to make sure that what patient has, that's what we're capturing. In case when we do that, you know, the amount of money which we'll have will be significantly higher, which allows us to really meet the healthcare expenditures of our medically complex patients. We as UCSD Health, you know clinically, we take care of a lot of medically complex patients. So we have to be reimbursed on the right amount to really support those members and provide all the necessary uh, team-based care and all the necessary health, uh, cover all their healthcare expenditure. So this is how we get paid, uh, not only now in Medicare Advantage, but this also applies now uh, for our Medicare ACO and other commercial plans also. So on saying, uh, speaking of commercial, you know, many of you are on commercial healthcare insurance. If you are on HealthNet Blue and Gold, that's a commercial insurance, which is funded through UC. But what's happening even in commercial area is that the amount of deductibles and family premiums people have patients or community members have to pay has continued to go higher than what's uh, happening on the workers earning or our total inflation rate. If you are a UC employee, uh, most of this healthcare uh, expenditure is uh, absorbed by the UCSD. You know, we pay uh, as the UCSD system pay for a lot of those uh, premiums for health and blue and gold, uh, so that the impact on the employees is less. But you can understand that we're, uh, if you're in the community, if you're a small employer, a lot of this cost shift has uh, shifted to the employees now. So if you look at what's happening in San Diego County, uh, more, uh, you know, San Diego County is known for being a small employer county. Uh, more, more employers are shifting their members into commercial insurance plan. And under commercial insurance, most of the members are in some kind of managed care or HMO plan. So San Diego County is one of the most highly penetrated managed care markets in California uh, under commercial insurance. You know. So to bring it all together for how does it play out at UCSD Health, the orange bar is where we are today on value-based care composition. You know. We have almost 53% of members under primary care under some kind of value-based care contract, whether it be capital commercial, Medicare ACO. And on the right-hand side, as a physician group, total physician group, we have almost 30 to 32% of uh, paired contract in some kind of value-based care. And for primary care, as we continue to advance next year into some other models like primary care first, this, this needle will keep moving more into this blue zone and we might have almost 60% of members in some kind of value-based care. So hopefully uh, by through sharing with you some of the national or local uh, landscape I was able to share with you, uh, what does it mean uh, to move from volume to value-based care and why we are, when we talk about moving from curve one to curve two, what does it mean? But I think importantly, this is also very, very true for our patients, our members. You know, as you see, healthcare insurance cost is now a major expenditure for a lot of families. And that's also eating into our social infrastructure needs. And you can see this is the, you know, as it, it, that, you know, how much it's affecting and for a lot of people, the struggle is real. Um, and we have to do something about this. So with that, you know, let's look at why population health. So the basic mantra for population health is that better care at lower cost, is it possible? Uh, in my mind, you know, I look at the value-based care as basically a simple mathematical equation that, you know, what are the outcomes that matter to patients divided by cost of delivering those outcomes? You know? So when you look at cost and total cost of care, what is happening again in the national healthcare is that the trends which are happening is that the aging of the population 
is really deteriorating the profitability of inpatient care. If you're a hospitalist, you know this, in the last 20 years, you have seen more and more of your members, patients in the hospital who are in seniors or of older age. If you look, outpatient care, uh, ambulatory care continues to grow, but care is shifting unevenly. Hospitals are not the only place where people are receiving care. And at the same time, hospitals and healthcare systems are losing the outpatient pricing advantage. You know, the employers, the insurers are really cutting, you know, making sure that they keep a um, check on the rate uh, rise increases they provide us. Also, purchases are increasingly steering high-end procedures or even high price procedures like, you know, not only the cancer screening, colon cancer screening, so knee replacement, and more and more procedures are done in ambulatory surgical centers. And also, there are now non-traditional uh, competitors which are entering the marketplace, like as I think you must have seen in your community, you have CVS, Men and Clinic Hubs, you have One Medical Group, you have Optum systems, you know, many uh, who are the non-traditional now appending the, uh, the established healthcare systems. But, you know, one thing I want to say is, you know, as a physician also that, you listen, there are times uh, cost of care is important. We need to support our patients during their complex illness and the some and healthcare expenditure at many times is, is rightfully justified. You know. But when we talk about cost of care, we are also talking about how do we identify waste? You know? So there was a paper some years back from PricewaterhouseCooper, which looked at what does waste mean? You know? So when, by waste, we talk about things like behavioral issues like obesity, smoking, or we talk about clinical issues like readmissions or hospital acquired infection or over prescribing antibiotics. And when you talk about operational issues like ineffective use of IT or claim processing or staffing turnover. So when you uh, sum it up, you know, as a country in the whole nation, we think some years back that, you know, the base was close to $1.2 trillion. And if we can manage some of these issues and we can really uh, get the total cost of care under control for this, we can flatten uh, the rising healthcare costs in the country or in the state or even for our own healthcare system. So our goal is, you know, how do we keep patients healthy, reduce waste, and we can reduce the cost of care at the same time provide better care for our patients. You know. So here is the definition for population health by NCQN, um, uh, Dr. Kane, the president, and I'll let you read this. But the important thing is how do we again keep patients healthy in the community, um, so get them self-engaged around their chronic disease management, and really have very targeted intervention. You know, that those are the key points for population health. You know. So at the same point, we have to meet the three-part aim, the triple aim, but we also now have to meet the quadruple aim, uh, which also improves clinician experience. And now there's also the five-part aim, which also is trying to address the issues with disparities. You know. So this is the foundation for us anytime internally at UCSD Health, we are trying to look at how to advance population health. So now next, let me try to share with you some of the examples of population health programs. So, uh, you know, population health is basically an umbrella organization. We try to work, you know, with community, we look at measurements, we work with care delivery systems, stratification, and, you know, and work a lot with the health plans and payers. You know. But to do this, first, we have to really have an IT enabled population health platform. We want to convert data into information. So for example, work of Dr. Sita Pati and her team, you know, through which we have almost 80 active registries that allows us to really uh, create some workflow, work streams, which allows us to complete care gaps, make targeted outreach, and also have patients enter data into this. So this is really foundational work on which, you know, population health can do its day-to-day -day clinical work. So let me share uh, four areas. So the four domains which we are trying to really prioritize are under population health. Um, one is trying to reduce uh, avoidable hospitalization. Second is choosing wisely campaign. Third is looking at digital health. And four is trying to address social determinants of health. So let me give you some examples around each of these. So first, you know, when you look at reducing avoidable hospitalization, 
So what's happening now? If you look in San Diego County, the fastest growing segment of population in San Diego County is the 85 years and above. So as we have an aging population, um, you know, the whole societal changes of what's happening and how long people are working, what's going to happen and how do we take care of them, uh, it, it will be a big issue in the coming years. So as you know, uh, I just want to share with you a funny clip on how the society may look in the coming years, you know. Wake up early, slap on some cologne. I'm 85 and I want to go home. Just got a job as a lifeguard in Savannah. I'm 85 and I want to go home. Dropping six beats, they called me DJ Nana. 85 and I want to go home. So let's not get mad, but let's see if we can build an age uh, appropriate health system as we can uh, as we continue to move forward. We have to really redesign the care for those who need it the most. Uh, if you look on the right hand side, the national cost per stay per admission in the hospital is around $13,500. When we look at UCSD Medicare ACO, um, the, uh, the average cost for hospitalization is close to $28,000 um, so it's pretty high. So if we can even prevent one hospitalization uh, or even we can do something about it, it has a huge impact, not only for patients and their family, but total cost of care, you know. So let's take an example of two patients. One we'll call it Mrs. Dorothy, one Mrs. Velma. Both have heart failure. But if you look at Mrs. Dorothy, she uh, had heart failure. She uh, used 911 ambulance. Uh, ended up in SNP, there were duplicate lab testing, you know, when she goes home, doesn't pick up her medications, but later on has falls, gets Percocet, lives alone, again, no one to take care of her and has, breaks her hip, has hip replacement, misses appointment, another stay, and goes on and on. So if you look at her explanation, you know, on the left-hand side, if you look at her, uh, the series of events which have happened and the explanation of benefits, you can see not only the total cost of care for her on the whole year was around $57,000, but her own out-of-pocket expense was close to $12,000. While on the right-hand side, you know, if you see the same patient who was in the hospital with heart failure, but what if we were able to offer services like transition of care, we had a case manager follow-up, we had a pharmacist review her medication, a nurse practitioner able to make home visit, some social worker support, by doing so, we could prevent her a cascading event of second hospitalization or frequent nursing home stay, frequent home health services. And by doing so, we could now look at total cost of care to be less. And also her own personal share of expenditure expenses is significantly less than Ms. Dorothy's. You know. So with that in mind, you know, we have top 10 ways which we are trying to work to reduce avoidable hospitalization. And it could be anywhere from identifying rising risk patients in our EPIC, uh, to making sure patients are seen frequently, trying to offer home-based care, uh, making sure we have advanced directives, our geriatric ED program, and you know, building up our palliative care program are some of the tactics which we can use to reduce hospitalization. So what I'm sharing here is, is some of the highest risk, but when we start looking at resource management and how do we manage a large population, let's assume for a minute that we have 100,000 patients. You know, The first way we can do is by risk stratifying the patients. Like many of you are walking well, uh, we could just say that your 60% of our membership is in, in this category. Likewise, if we were to risk stratify, we will find that 5% of the patients are multiple complex illnesses, who use hospital as a place of service. And then there are people in between who have one or two chronic conditions and multiple chronic conditions. So the way in population health, we are trying to really right size the staffing is that for patients who are really uh, in healthy, they might just benefit from health coach because you might just need a reminder for some preventive care. While on the top is patients who are really homebound, home confined, who use hospital a lot, we could offer a home visit through nurse practitioner, social worker, pharmacist, et cetera. Now, when you start thinking about 100,000 patients, you know, even though we right-size the staff, we'll never have enough people to really 
staff every single tier. So hence, we have to also uh, use technology to as a way to supplement this and try to have things like digital health for chrome monitoring chronic condition, trying to have automated messages to really get people uh, to get reminders to increasingly use things like AI to really risk stratify and also make necessary outreach. But all of this lies on the foundation of our existing workflows like analytics, Epic Healthy Planet, Patient Portal, Nav, uh, Care Nav Hub, Telehealth, New Patient Appointments, all of this is the foundation when you're starting to look at you know, how we manage 100,000 lives. So for example, we are uh, offering more now home-based care uh, through our nurse practitioners. And this has been really welcomed not only by patients, but their families who are really appreciative of, uh, of, of their coordinated care, which they're getting at home now. We are also offering for seniors now through our health, uh, health insurance contract. It's not only just health insurance, but we are also offering the supplemental benefits. And supplemental benefits could be in form of fitness or eye exam, hearing aid, but also important things like food security or transportation. And by offering this now, we are trying to really have this combined, you know, a comprehensive plan for our patients uh, with, with uh, where health insurance and supplemental benefits both are like a game changer. You know. To show you some of the data for UCSD, uh, when you look at UCSD Medicare ACO population, uh, you can see bit, you know, where we were for admissions uh, sometime early 2019. The blue line is what the national Medicare ACO trend is. You can see compared to that national trend, we have made uh, significant improvement. Yes, we did have COVID pandemic at some point, but as you can see, overall, we have uh, made um, improvement even after that. So yes, we are trying to be an age-friendly health system. Uh, and I think um, there's still a lot of work to be done, but we are making progress. You know? So then the second area, which I would like to address with you is choosing wisely. I think many of you know about Choosing Wisely. It's an initiative of the ABIM Foundation, which really promotes that we should order tests which are really necessary, not duplicative, free from harm. Uh, there was a good paper some years back which showed that you know, for tests which are low cost, you know, which are at low cost of less than $538, we tend to order a lot of it and eventually it costs us twice as much. You know. So we have to start looking at things where we are ordering appropriate lab testing, imaging, or medication management. And to give you some example, you know, um, if you look at things like don't do, you know, imaging for uncomplicated headache, and a CT scan may cost $800. When we looked at our internal data, we found that we were still having uh, some CT scans being ordered for uncomplicated headaches. You know, but what if we can educate the patients? And I do understand the patient pressure sometimes. Uh, what if we can educate material using from choosing wisely, like when you need a CT scan or when you don't need for imaging for headaches? You know? Likewise, when you look at vitamin D testing, uh, the cost is low. It's only $93 per test. But when you start looking at the total cost of care for vitamin D testing, it does add up because all of us, many of us are ordering that vitamin D test. But what if we were able to educate the members to say when you need those and when you don't? You know? What we find sometimes is that you know, uh, physicians or APPs are unaware that in their lab favorite profile, they do have vitamin D uh, as one of the lab tests and it just gets ordered in uh, automatic fashions as a profile rather than uh, a thoughtful uh, ordering of individual tests. You know. Likewise, when you look at uh, imaging tests for CT scan or MRI for low back pain, you know, when you look at UCSD Health and where we are compared to other healthcare systems, uh, this is from some years back, but you know we are smack in the middle. So I hope that the decision support we have now in the EHR and EPIC will help us to really uh, be judicious in when we order uh, uh, imaging tests for routine low back pain uh, versus when we have patients have red flags. You know. When we look at some of the pharmacy examples, uh, you know, when we look for our self-funded plan and you know the UC employee health plan, things like our health and blue and gold. You know, that's actually us, we fund that program, UCSD funds that, you know, and all the pharmacy claims and everything is comes out of the one budget, you know, our budget. So what if we could use some of the, you know, if you look on the left-hand side, some of those drugs, but on the right-hand side in the yellow, you can see the equally efficacious drugs, which we could do therapeutic substitution. And by doing so, we can bring affordability for our members on this high cost drugs. 
So with that in mind, some, uh, you know, working with our IS team, we have rolled out this pre-check my script, which is a real-time prescription benefit. And since June, going live in June, there have been 54,000 alerts, which have, you know, been fired in Epic. But, you know, I think it's, it's, it's for you to consider, you know, you are the clinician, but basically it provides you an alternative, uh, you know, for example, uh, uh, medication which needs to be taken for a long term, uh, you know, 90 day fills uh, and a mail order prescription is always comes out cheaper for the member and brings it afford makes it affordable for them rather than a 30 day prescription. You know, likewise, there are alternatives for you on which you know you can have sort of shared decision making discussion with the patient at the time of prescribing. So let's see how this goes, but I think we're excited about having this uh, capability in our EHR and thanks to the IS team here. So the next area which I would like to share with you is around digital health. Uh, you know, I think the COVID pandemic showed us that there is importance of telehealth, and we were we are all become you know we are all using that modality. But telehealth comes in different flavors. You know, a, anywhere from e-consults to video visits to digital health. And when you look at the national landscape, you know, I think you know this, there are many now uh, vendors who are offering these services, you know, like Teladoc, you know, which is one of the first publicly traded companies has really large accounts, you know, from Merck or Marriott, et cetera. And the reason being that they're offering the services at $100 less than an office visit. But Teladoc is also now merged with a company called Levango, and this was a $37 billion uh, merger earlier this year because they want to get into the space of chronic disease management. You know, So what's happening is that employers, you know, large national employers are signing up with these vendors directly. And we as you know, physicians or clinicians may not be aware that our patients are already, already receiving the services, the telehealth services or chronic disease management services through these vendors uh, and outside the, our ecosystem. So uh, at UCSD Health, we are not behind. We, we want to be ahead of this. We want to offer the similar services. So we are leveraging technology through various ways for our members. Uh, for example, we are offering digital health coaching program, which is a texting program, which sort of reinforces healthy education and healthy behavior. So if you have coached someone, they have gone through the program, we can continue to offering some of the texting program uh, on how they can continue to reinforce healthy behaviors. You know. Likewise, we are offering uh, remote uh, monitoring for, uh, for blood glucose. We are offering digital health for where now we have a capability to really aggregate data from various remote uh, people's patients' own glucometers. And it's coming into one big dashboard, which allows us to, on a population level, track how people are performing uh, and we can remotely manage their diabetes. You know. Likewise, we are offering free blood pressure cuffs for patients with uncontrolled hypertension so that our teams and you can manage remotely patients and get patients under control uh, for hypertension. In primary care clinics, now we have teleretinal cameras. They are for diabetes and hypertension screening. And they're helping not only to bring the convenience to the member, they don't have to travel to different places, but also by offering the services at point of care uh, we are increasing the number of screening people are undergoing. And also this way we can prevent the blindness associated with diabetes and hypertension. We are now uh, also partnering with, uh, you know, novel technologies like this is some work we are doing with Dr. Kevin King from cardiology uh, through IRB research, where we have this bed post scales, which allows us to offer a home telemetry type of uh, monitoring for patients who are bed confined or home confined and by offering this kind of telemetry, uh, we can now uh, act early on their uh, condition and sort of prevent avoidable hospitalization. We have now care teams like families working and they're using this digital health uh, devices and also offering this comprehensive services for our members to get more and more patients uh, under control for their chronic diseases like diabetes and hypertension. So all of this is possible through uh, work with IS in trying to pull in a lot of the data from various devices. So, you know, through using Apple Health or Google Fit and all this information is coming into now or Epic. And in my mind, this is really, really was an instrumental to really help us 
track patients and have all their information tracked into one single health record so that it's available and visible to everyone and we can now manage uh, patients um, in a pretty holistic manner and rather than being a siloed approach. You know. But all of this also needs patient engagement. It needs a care team. You know. We cannot just throw a device, we cannot just throw an app at a patient and expect that they'll somehow uh, engage or they'll stick to that. You know, we need a digital healthcare team to continue tracking those patients. I gave you some example of PharmD who are helping to use that as a management tool, but also we need you. It means, you know, I am requesting that your help and as physicians in APP to continue promoting this to our patients, getting them on, to staying them, um, keeping them on this platform so that we can get their chronic disease under management over time, you know. Again, you know, the point here is that just throwing a device or technology does not work, you know. We need the care team. And to drive home that point, I want to share with you a clip, you know. Sag mal, Papa, habe ich dich noch gar nicht gefragt. Wie kommst du eigentlich mit dem neuen iPad zurecht, was wir dir zum Geburtstag geschenkt haben? Gut. Mit den ganzen Apps kommst du klar? Was denn für Apps? Geh mal bitte ein Stück zur Seite. So. Was ist? So I think you realize that, you know, we need a team to really manage digital health. You know. So the next point, you know, last is around social determinants of health. This is very important. And I think many of you know this, that, you know, 10% of person's health is driven by healthcare, but 40% is through, you know, what happens to the consumer's behavior, things like tobacco, alcohol. And increasingly now, you know, we are identifying social isolation which is itself becoming a pandemic, you know. And now even the federal government has this as uh, on the radar. And uh, this is from some years back from uh, former HHS Secretary Alex Azar. And I'll let you read what he had to say. But, you know, when you look at, when you look at you know, our UCSD Medicare members, ACO program members, you see that you know the prevalent disease are things like COPD, you know, heart disease, heart failure, vascular disease, diabetes, and all of this, all of this, as you know, requires that we try to understand their social determinants of health. Because until we don't understand those or address those issues, we will not get their chronic disease under management. You know, likewise, we have to address race and uh, the impact of disparities in care. If you look at this uh, slide, you know, among our UCSD patients with hypertension, if you see the average control for blood pressure is around 66%. The top performing groups in California have a blood pressure control rate of around 80% or above. But when you start breaking down this data by race and ethnicity, you can see there's almost a 10% difference in control among blood, uh, for blood pressure. Likewise, when you look uh, at UC wide, when we look at uh, work with all the UCs, um, you can see that African Americans or Blacks have 3% lower blood pressure control rate than the average which we have at the, around the UC system. You know. It's a, when you look at uh, gender disparity, you know, if you look at the uh, patients who are prescribed uh, statins, if you look at on the left-hand side, women who had uh, CVD and were prescribed a statin versus men who were were prescribed statins, there is a almost 14% difference in age and gender uh, control, you know. And there are many papers now on the age and gender disparity also, and we have to address these issues and bring equity here. So with that in mind, the five areas which we are prioritizing, prioritizing for health disparities and equity effort is around uh, have addressing uh, diabetes among Latinx, uh, blood pressure control among Black and African-Americans, maternal and child health among Black natives and immigrants, and colon cancer screening among Blacks and African-Americans. So these are the areas where we want to uh, first bring equity uh, in our outreach and completing uh, and getting people under control. 
So one of the ways we try to do this is trying to collect data. You know, this is the social determinants of health wheel. You must have seen this in Epic, but our population health teams are always collecting this information. They're gathering information about hey, patients and completing this way for things like example, alcohol use or intimate partner violence or food insecurity or stress issues. You know. On top of this, when you collect this data, we are also running it through Healthy Place Index. Uh, you must have heard about this index, but it's also an economic indicator looking at things like, hey, how's the transportation in the neighborhood? What's the clean environment? What is the housing? And what you're seeing here is a map of San Diego, and you can see uh, you know, the dense green means that the, that's a pretty good Healthy Place Index, while blue is, you know, it's a Healthy Place Index is less. You know, So you can see from this that overall uh, we have uh, you know, we have our patients who are coming from the blue neighborhoods, you know, they're coming from the blue into the green, uh, and we have to not only address their, um, their under social determinants of health, but this gives us a comprehensive view of how people are and where they are in their healthcare. To give you some concrete example, when we look at patients with blood pressure and Blacks and African American, we are now, we can see not only in yellow that we are offering the medical care, but we have to look at social determinants of health, like, hey, what is the tobacco use, alcohol use, anxiety use, and then address structural barriers like, you know, who are the people uh, who are in the lowest HPI and it can give us a comprehensive view of their underlying issues. So to give you uh, another example, during the peak of COVID pandemic, you know, uh, and during one quarter, we reached out to almost 2000 patients and inquired about these issues and 90% of the patients were fine. They, were, they didn't have an issue, but there were people who had issues with medications, poor insecurity, stress management, and we were able to escalate those issues and try to either get the medications or address their stress issues during this, during this time of crisis. You know. So likewise, we are doing a, a pilot program. We are doing a pilot program with CDC and Be There San Diego, where we are offering medically tailored meals to patients with hypertension. Uh, these are people with difficult to control by hypertension and see if this kind of medically tailored meals will help patients in the long term to get better control. You know. So hopefully uh, I was able to share with you some of the examples, but last, you know, I wanna share with you, how do we provide support for population health program? What I've shared with you is a very comprehensive uh, program uh, and how we are doing a very, uh, providing this wraparound services for members who who uh, in between clinic visits and how we are providing that support in the community. You know, we don't get any grants to, to support this, you know, but the way we are trying to do this is first is to form some kind of linkages. You know, for example, when we work with community, um, this is some pictures uh, from some time back when we worked with black churches to really raise awareness of cardiovascular disease in the community. You know, I showed you some of the team-based, you know, like the farm D program we have, and the six month, you know, when we looked at this program, we were able to show that there was a decrease in uh, improvement in blood pressure control among patients with hypertension, blood pressure control among patients with diabetes, and A1C, improvement in A1C. So we'll have to see over long term how this trends out and how it does, but we are seeing some positive outcomes here. When you start applying this on a larger population, here is a paper which was published, we published, uh, was published sometime back in Health Affairs which shows that you know, in San Diego County, when such team-based model was applied, um, the acute myocardial infarction rate decreased by 22% compared to the rest of the California. So there was almost an $86 million saving in during the six years of collaborative. Now, no one wrote us a check, no one gave us a paper check, uh, there was no publishing clearhouse type of balloons, et cetera. But it was that you know, if you are in a value-based care, think about it, if we can do something to avoid cost, that really goes to then um, support some of other patients with chronic illnesses and at least prevent things like uh, strokes and heart attacks in our community. You know. When we look at our UCSD ACO program, we just got results for 2020 in the month of September. And you can see we did pretty well on quality scores. You know, there was a high usage of population health team by patients and providers. And patients also rated their physicians, you, many of you who are in this meeting, uh, pretty highly. You know. But also there was an impact of $7.5 million of total revenue. Now this was not just us, you know, this was, we have participants from Imperial County, we have participants from uh, Temecula, 
But certain portion of this, which uh, comes to UCSD Health, now we can reinvest back into our operations, reinvest back into the teams and how we manage and help our community and our population. You know, the, we have received recognition for commercial Medicare from Integrated Healthcare Association, which is a statewide organization on how uh, excellent healthcare you are providing to your members, you know, because this becomes very important during our contract negotiations with payers and our uh, employers. Because nowadays, if you don't, if you're not showing outcomes, you're not showing outcome based for, for perform, uh, then there is no payments or people even do not contract with us, you know. So having this such kind of demonstrating such quality of care for our members through these plans allows us to continue uh, supporting uh, our existing membership and grow that membership. So hopefully I was able to share with you four examples here. And if you ask me, is better care at lower cost, is it possible? And the answer is yes. You know. Um, and today I hope I was able to share with you uh, about transition of value-based care, why population health, examples of population health program, support for population health program, and I would like to end with this quote by Dr. Gawande, and I'll let you read this. And in that spirit, you know, I also want to take a moment to thank all of your Department of Medicine faculty who collaborates with Population Health Team. You know, uh, many of you uh, not only help us lead the programs, you advise us, you guide us on how we can take better care of our patients. And I just want to take a moment to thank you. So at this moment, you know, I'll stop and take any Q&A. Thank you, Dr. Agnihotri, for that uh, inspiring presentation. We're very grateful to you. Dr. Agnihotri's presentation is open for questions. Please type your questions in the Q&A. Dr. Agnihotri, can you tell us what do you think are the top priorities um, for our healthcare system as we head into um, the upcoming year? Yeah, so the top priorities we have are one is we want to lower uh, hospitalize, avoidable hospitalization for our uh, frail or vulnerable seniors. We are trying to get into this uh, new measure called as days at home, which means that how can we support our members at home as much as possible. Uh, you know, no senior, no family wants to think that during Thanksgiving, I'm going to be in the hospital, right? So, you know, we have to support that. Um, second is that we want to make sure that we take care of medically complex patients, that we continue to demonstrate the complexity of our patients to our payers. By doing so, we can uh, then have the appropriate, you know, reimbursement to support, you know, our medically complex patients, you know. The third area is we want to support, you know, chronic disease management around areas like, you know, diabetes and blood pressure. That's also an initiative across UC wide. So UCLA, UCSF, UC Davis, UC Irvine, we are all in the same. We are all trying to see how we can improve blood pressure control rate, diabetes control rate. Uh, how can we improve depression screening? You know, mental health is very important. We want to integrate the behavioral health component and bring more and more of that, you know. Uh, lastly, I think immunization is important. We have seen the value of immunization. So we are participating in a national campaign around uh, promoting immunizations for flu and uh, zoster and a lot of the pneumonia vaccination, the vaccination. So, so I think that's a comprehensive, uh, you know, that's, that's a four or five areas which we are prioritizing for. But, but you know, Dr. Sal, I want to say that through all of this, we want to be providing really the team-based care, which is really necessary for Department of Medicine to really provide care for the complex patients. So we, I hope, you know, we continue to build that journey. Do you want me to answer this question on? Uh... Oh, terrific. Yes, thank you. Um, from Dr. Baxi, 
What is your opinion about drug companies advertising expensive medications on TV directly to patients and patients then demanding them from their provider when older, cheaper medications are just as good? You're absolutely right. You know, I think we are totally, you know, uh, against uh, direct to consumer advertising. Um, it seems like every person uh, who is getting that drug is the happiest person on planet Earth, you know, right? So I think we are very, care you know, I think um, it creates real challenge. And I, that's why I think I showed you the real time prescription benefit, you know, uh, which is from IS and, you know, Dr. Millen can also chime in on that. But I think, you know, having that tool in front of you during prescribing and having that, you know, shared decision-making conversation at that time is very important. Uh, we don't work directly with any direct, direct pharma companies. Uh, we we want we, we are very careful with our PBMs. You know, as, as UC system, there's a new uh, pharmacy benefit manager management system also. So, you know, really, our uh, you're spot on. You know, pharmaceutical cost is the number one rising cost in in the country for us. Uh, the high cost drugs, injectables, will break the healthcare system, for example, um, the new drug for Alzheimer's, you know, I know it's controversial, but, you know, having that $60,000 drug plus the, all the testing which goes on is going to break Medicare further, you know. So, uh, I mean, I could go on, but, you know, I totally agree with your point, viewpoint, you know. Excellent. And then a question, uh, how are the priorities selected each year for the population health team? Yeah, so this, you know, a lot of it is we align with the national program. I mean, as UCSD Health, we were slightly off that track for some years. Uh, so I think in the last few years, you know, we track, make sure that we align with CMS, we, we track with uh, a lot of the health plans. So sometimes, you know, these are, we're just trying to align there so that, you know, uh, we can not only show the outcomes which you deliver to all your members uh, in a very good way, but also we want, um, we have an executive governing board for population health, you know, your uh, department of medicine chair is also on that member on that team. Um, and we, by working with them, we can we prioritize those measures, you know. There's also work through ambulatory quality. There are sub work groups. Many of you sit on those committees. So you also help us to prioritize. Dr. Sitapati, for example, is one of those leaders, you know. Thank you. And from Dr. Longhurst, Great talk. Where do you see opportunities to innovate that might be unique to UC San Diego Health? Yeah, so Dr. Longhurst uh, has been a great uh, help us in, in making sure that we continue to be on the cutting edge of innovation. So I think the new uh, health innovation system, uh, which has been uh, which has been created to offer digital health, digital health technology, uh, is I think the path forward, you know, more and more of our patients want to be self, you know, to be involved in the, their own health. They want to be engaged in their uh, management of their chronic condition. And I think using digital health, um, AI type of platforms is where the future is. And I think, as you can see, we are on that journey, uh, but I think we have to do more of that, you know, in coming years. Excellent. And then from Dr. Malhotra, he says, I was told a few years ago that the system makes money on readmissions despite Medicare penalties, et cetera. Is that still true with increasing value-based pur purchasing? I mean, you know, I think, Dr. Malhotra, that's a good question and it's a very policy-driven uh, question. Uh, but readmission is the, one of the measures under value-based care uh, purchasing um, analysis. Um, but, you know, when you count the, just the readmission for Medicare under the healthcare system, the, the individual contribution and, and the total amount which you get either incentivized or penalized is very, very, very small, you know. So hence, you know, what we are looking and what CMS is also looking is that how do we look at acute hospital utilization, which is trying to prevent the even the index admission and trying to, you know, the hospital should be only for people for people who really truly need it. You know, as you know, and Dr. Salyar also works in hospital, we really want the right patient in the, uh, in the hospital, the right head, head in the right bed, you know. 
So I think when you look at it from economic impact, it's, it's about total cost of care. It's not about you know, individual single measure, but how we can lower total cost of care, which helps to support all the members um, across the continuum. You know? So it's a very um, policy, it's a good question, you know, and I, I'd be happy to take it offline also with you. Thank you. From Dr. Wen, the uh, population health team and staff are truly unsung heroes. We appreciate them and their work. What are some challenges you hope to overcome with our current practices as we move into this value-based infrastructure you are helping to build? So I, I think, you know, we have to build this team-based model, um, but also I think, you know, increasingly we have to, you know, I think we were so focused on this uh, RVU-based type of payment model, which, you know, sometimes may not behoove us well, you know, I think it's not, you know, uh, it's it's also looking at how do we do panel management, you know, and I think when we look at panel management, it's not about just uh, access is not about just in-person care, it's access is about access to the right care at the right place at the right time, you know. So it can be access is, it's access to healthcare in my mind. So I think we have to start moving into, as you know, many systems have tried to do this in primary care is to try to really start looking into panel-based management type of approach, you know. So we have to not only think about the patient who's in front of us, but also those patients who never came to see us, but are still assigned to us or attributed to us, where we are responsible for their quality and cost of care. So it's more moving towards panel-based type of approach as we go, you know, and there are many things we can do going forward, right? But, you know, one way I think is operationally thinking we have to change it to be more a panel-based operation management, you know. Thank you. And one final question from Dr. Diaz. When you discuss better care for less cost, I sometimes hear more work on frontline healthcare workers, primary care doctors, et cetera. How do you protect physicians who are, you are asking to perform more HCC documentation needs, dealing with more population health pop-ups, messages, and MAs performing more screening functions? How do you protect these physicians and staff from even more work on their already demanding days? So Dr. Jassal, um, Dr. Diaz and we have been having this dialogue through these forums many times, you know. So I want to be respectful of everyone's uh, time and, you know, I would welcome Dr. Diaz to reach out to me directly and we can use that to address this. But I think the primary care leadership at Dr. Lundy, Dr. Sitapati, and General Internal Medicine, and previously Dr. Larry Friedman have tried to really address Dr. Diaz's questions on this matter before. And I respect his, I respect and recognize his opinion, but I want to, it's a very, uh, listen, I know we are trying to move from volume to value-based care. And during that shift, there will be times when it feels like we are, you know, we are straddling two boats, you know. And it feels struggle, you know, I feel it, you know, I see patients snap, we do that, but we have to make that necessary shift. And during this time, you know, we can only provide a lot of support. There's a lot of work which is done for members when they're not just in front of you, but they're also uh, done when they are, you know, outside of their clinic walls, they, you know, a lot of support, whether it be calling people and getting them colon cancer screening tests. It's not just people are sending messages to you, you know, to Dr. Diaz, you know this. There are people are also reaching out to patients with uncontrolled blood pressure um, through PharmD, helping general internal medicine did not even have that option before. Now you have that option. There are people didn't were, there were uh, people being managed for their blood glucose. General internal medicine did not have this option two years back. You have that option people who are being home confined, who are being seen without uh, you having to address those issues or making home visit. Three years back, you didn't have that option. Today, you have that option. People are being seen in skilled nursing home previously. The medicine people had to take calls. You don't have to take those calls. Those calls are being addressed today, right? So I can go on and on about a lot of this support, but I really want us to think of us as collaborators. I want us to think that we are team here we are all working in this um, 
this changing environment. We won't be succeed in this, but I cannot tell you how much material support which we are providing um, to support primary care basis. And I think a lot of my colleagues uh, and the primary care leadership will understand. But again, I'm happy to take a uh, one-on-one -on -one question and you know, people know how to, uh, there's my email in the bottom. I'm very uh, open to learning from you and sharing uh, sharing what we have. You know. Thank you so much, Dr. Agnihotri. I hope all of you will join us next week for another Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sarah.